Hey everybody, welcome back to Sex, Drugs, and the Epigenome. I am back again with our very happy, very happy Dr. Seeds. I like it. <laughs> Dr. Seeds, uh, we, I feel like I haven't talked to you in such a long time because I'm so used to, to chatting with you almost every day in the past couple of weeks. That was, that's what we've been doing. And now it's been like, uh, haven't heard from you in like a week. Stranger. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I got to pick, I, I got to choose my times when I can hide from you and, and, <laughs> and get, get my life in track on track and put, make sure my circadian rhythms are getting closer to where they're supposed to be. And then you come along and they get messed up again. Get, you know? Getting prepared. Yes. <laughs> that is a wonderful segue actually into today's incredible topic that uh, was actually a, a, a spark. Uh, the idea sparked because of Mastermind Chicago, the SSRP Chicago, where we're just at. Um, and that was a big, big keynote in your lectures over the two days was when you said you're describing one of your patients and how, you know, you were trying a couple of things. And then it, it was this like, button where the light bulb went out when you started thinking about the circadian rhythm and how it's it's something that that possibly gets overlooked but the importance of it is tremendous and you were describing it and you made these wonderful animations and we got to we got to show these very complex you know um pathways uh all based around the circadian rhythm and and that importance um so can we start there, Doc? Can we start with, uh, for those of you, those of our listeners who are unfamiliar with what this is, uh, let's define it, circadian rhythms. Sure. And, and I think it's, it's, it's actually a, so it, it's basically how we exist. Um, the, the, the biochemistry and molecular pathways that make our cells function are absolutely whole, 100% related to the night and day cycles of how the earth rotates 24 hours a day. And our basis of being is, is has really been, has grown from this mechanism of night and day and how the the projection of like when the sun rises the that light goes into the optic nerve through the eye and and goes signals these neurons in the suprachiasmic nuclei of the hypothalamus and it starts this process that um, that turns on what we call the the master you know uh, regulator of the circadian rhythms and it's the master clock and it's in the brain and then that sends out messages it starts translation of RNA and and these messaging agents that then transcribe these genes will transcribe proteins that will kind of set the mechanisms for what the body needs to survive during the day. And, and basically it sets all the organs in rhythm. It, set, it sets all the cells basically in the same rhythm. So your cells all have circadian clocks, your organs have these clocks. Um, and, and that's how you kind of have to think of it. You've got the master um, control and it sets those clocks of the body and then those the body can have influences on that master clock also um, so there can be feedback and that's all structured around daytime and nighttime so there's there's a lot of validity in the statements about how life you know, how we're affecting disease and aging and cancer because we're not being cognizant or we're, we're not realizing how important these circadian clocks are in, in um, regulating mechanisms 
of cellular function that uh, are necessary to keep us in what I like to say is the, a normal homeostatic state of, you know, the, where the yin and the yang of the cell is working well, basically. And it just takes little disruptions and, and it, it makes sense because let's just say you, let's just make it easy and say your sleep is disrupted. Well, everybody knows what happens when their sleep is disrupted. They feel terrible the next day or their day isn't functional or, well, you've disrupted your circadian clock of where that is nighttime, that is rest time, that is repair. That's when other mechanisms are happening in the cells to get you prepared for the morning. And if they're not happening, then that morning comes along and the cell's not prepared. So, so that's kind of what's happening. It's you're not giving the, the body its time to prepare for the needs of the next day. And, and so that's how it's easy for people to understand then, you know, that, okay, wow, there are some mechanisms here. So sleep is part of this and, um, and waking up in the morning, it, you know, it, as the sun rises is, is kind of that initial, you know, aspect of, uh, of starting the circadian mechanisms. And because it turns on this, it actually turns on the mechanisms of, of pathways that will make um, certain um, nutrient or certain nucleotide um, cofactors that are very necessary to control what we call redox. And what's that mean? It just means energy production to make the cell function well. And that's this NAD that is started to be, uh, the, the salvage pathway starts once we get up in the morning and sunlight comes in, this whole pathway starts to function and in producing the NAD that we need to survive and, mm -hmm. and, and to make all of these reactions occur during the daytime. So, so it's, there, there's this intricate mechanisms of signaling, of cell signaling that goes on that is very consistent and regimented with the this master clock and all the clocks outside of uh, in, in different cells so so that is um you, you know in getting that understanding of a night and day we can see how our our metabolism um and it has been specifically orchestrated around that 24 hour cycle. And, um, and so that's when, you know, if you travel and you go across multiple time zones that can affect your circadian rhythms and, and, and you can feel that effect. You can feel more fatigued. You can, you know, if you're not on that clock schedule and that make, that's a good indicator that to, to kind of give people this understanding that, yeah, the circadian clock is a real, is the real deal. And in fact, um, it's some of the hottest literature in, in cancer research right now, in immune research, um, and in metabolic diseases. And um, so, so yes, um, there's great significance in this master clock and, and resynchronizing this clock for people that are in areas of um, distress with diseases or metabolic disorders or, or cancer, because that step is absolutely necessary to re, to resynchronize. And I don't care what drug you're giving people. I don't care what treatments you're giving them. If you don't get their clock back, all that's, you're, you're, you're going to fail. And, and uh, that I, I I'll back that up a hundred percent. It's going to fail. And that's why this whole, see, Toby agreed with me. Um, that's why this whole thing is, uh, this whole process of, you know, tree, of working with aging and disease and cancer is multifactorial. And, and you have to have a good understanding of all of these, how all these things can come together. And so, you know, simple things, I might be jumping ahead because um, you just let me keep talking, but uh, you know, eating and exercise, you know, that seem to be common themes we discuss. I mean, ex exercise helps in resetting the clock. 
in resynchronizing the circadian clock and and that's that's feedback that's coming into the circadian master clock and and helps with the peripheral clocks it's an excellent excellent way to reestablish this clock and and not to get into great detail but it's some of the things i went into in the cancer talk and and may get got gave people a better understanding of how the body ramps up and and builds up its highest peaking of um, to build up its uh reducing power by nadph um which is a redox cofactor that's real important in controlling inflammation and disease and helping with antioxidants and all the things that kind of keep the keep the inflammatory status of the body in control and that is has absolutely everything to do with the circadian rhythms also so i mean i could go on and on but it, and food timing of food is essential in working with circadian rhythms and you've heard me talk about it many times with patients and and people uh in in teaching uh, in, in our courses about how timing, nutrient timing is critical in uh, establishing uh, and, and trying to reset and resynchronize the clock if it's out, but, but wrong nutrient timing can desynchronize the circadian rhythms and, and can start disease and, and processes and inflammation and reactive oxygen species and all these things. And, and so, it gets it you can carry this into any disease process and 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 the significance can be um unbelievable when you start looking at dif different metabolic problems diseases and you know just like we have this this um our big week coming up with the alzheimer's uh, association uh foundation that we're doing the um uh, the discussions with, um, uh, you know, kind of opening up this door to let people know that maybe there are a lot of ways to look at this disease in a different, from a different side of it to, to maybe get more proactive and the things we can do to improve this. I, I see this, uh, this wave of, of dementia that is something that we haven't really done well with in the past and and circadian rhythms have everything to do with dementia and alzheimer's and in fact that's a big area of research too and and we're finding out that that you know that uh, that's probably if we if you speak to if you speak to caregivers that are taking care of um their loved ones and with this disease you know we we typically we know this problem of of as dementia progresses and especially with alzheimer's that one of the most difficult things is as the early afternoon early evening time comes these patients these people can get um um can get more uh combative and more disoriented and um we've been able to actually link that to the circadian clock at, at least in animal models where we've been able to show oh my gosh there is actually a pathway where light you know because because the we know that there's this pathway that exists in the brain and where the when this superventricular uh 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 where, where the where the let's let's make it simple where the brain let's say the light activates the brain because of light going through the optic nerve into the brain and it 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 activates the suprachiasmic nuclei that that actually set off some signals to an air another area in the brain that are these GABAergic areas that then automatically inhibit an area of aggression in the brain. And we found that in this Alzheimer's type of model that, co that very much mimics what happens to these dement dementia patients later, or these, these people afflicted with this, this problem, 
um, with with uh, brain disease and neurodegeneration and eventually Alzheimer's or this mild cognitive impairment as it progresses, they this absolutely matches these pathways in where something that's supposed to be inhibited to stop aggression actually is inhibited right at the, the in the evening where that signaling stops, and they and that they found that if just by potentially um, turning on some of those neurons again with that have everything to do with like a uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide, the IP, which, it, which is what is a very significant signaling agent in the, um, in the hypothalamus, um, or, but or in, in these neurons in the suprachiasmic nuclei um, that it's actually that those neurons and that VIP that turns this stuff off. So we've, we've had this kind of this research in animals around for some years, and it's been something I've been very interested in in, in looking at uh, where I've, uh, I've found that things like VIP can have a significant influence in helping those, those people um, that are in that state if you catch them earlier when they're getting into that state, you can actually turn that down. You can knock it down um, and improve it significantly um, to, to control it. And typically we wouldn't use VIP later in the evening because it can, it can work against and keep people up and make them you know, even more energetic. It's why, we, it's why we say use that peptide in the morning and use it in the afternoon. But in this case, because of some dis disynchronization of problems that happen because of um, Alzheimer's or, or aging and neurodegenerative disease, they get this sundowning effect. And this can, this can have significant influence on that. And you could even go on, you could even make that correlation. Now, I, I haven't done it, but, um, but I know physicians that have treated this with, um, with light therapy, that's the same thing. And, and it absolutely, they, they swear by it, that the light therapy makes a big difference in that evening time frame. But it's, it's all the same mechanisms of, of turning on, um, of, of turning that, that, those switches on to inhibit this GABAergic process that's, that, that's taking place. So just some fascinating stuff like that has real relevance in how we go about and look at what we can do to influence treatment and in, in care for people in significant disease states like that. But it also has everything to do with weight loss and weight gain um, and cancer. And so the implications are, are huge. And so this field is exploding into you know, new areas and it's getting this, it's called a, oh, what is it? Chronobiology now, where you're seeing more and more research focused on this, on, on these processes around uh, encircling um, circadian clocks and rhythms. So, so I'm, I'm, you know, I've always been fascinated by it. You know, it's been a, it's been a topic in every one of my masterminds where I've slowly been helping all our physicians understand the, the, the molecular pathways that are specific to these and these tra the transcription factors that are really important to understand in how the, um, these, the main circadian clock is controlled and how it influences our peripheral clocks in our, in our organs and in our cells because it has everything to do with what I've always said, Karen Wright, is controlling redox and how redox is affected and how they both affect each other. And, and it's just so, it's so intriguing and interesting, um, I think, to once you start putting these things together, the, the uh, implications get to be, I, I think, significant because of the, you know, the biological clock, if it goes bad, your immune system is affected, your protective systems of the cell are affected, your mitochondrial functions affected, the biogenesis of cells, the production of, of the good things and energy hemostasis that you need are all disrupted. And that's significant, you know? 
Um, so Doc, I've got I've got a few questions. I'm sorry I let you go for so long, but I was writing down all these little things that I want to come back to, if you don't mind. Sure. And I love that you're talking about the Alzheimer's thing because because that's happening this weekend. Uh, but first, you mentioned that eating, exercise, sleep. Those are the three, three, I guess, factors of maintaining good circadian health. Can I call it that? Um, is there anything else on that list? Well, those are the things that most people are most familiar with that uh -huh. actually have the greatest influence on the circadian clock, um, our exercise, sleep, and nutrition. And that makes sense. I mean, that's th those are kind of the keys that we all, that, that everybody, uh, uh, attest to in, in being the most significant factors of improving life as we know it and, and improving, um, all this, all the aspects that have to do with disease and, and, and um, performance on the other side too. So, yeah. So that, I mean, it's that, it, it really is that simple and, and how these all are key regulators. They're, they're, the regulators that people are familiar with. Now, they all have an, now those things all have an influence on, on different aspects of, of, you know, how they feed back to the central clock um, and how just dysregulation in that clock can start this process of um, just slow, um, integration of inflammation. I mean, if you just pick one organ, like we talked about the brain, you know, just that dysregulation can start the inflammation. It can stop, it can start decreasing cerebral blood flow. It can start decreasing melatonin. It can start decreasing or increasing metabolic, uh, homeostatic problems that we can't control. And then we get these, um, amyloid beta accumulations and then glymphatic disruption and all of that leads to more tau pathology right and more oxidative stress and then insulin systems are dysregulated and then neuronal cell death i mean it's it's this it just Jeez. goes on it and it's all it's amazing how you can relate that back to and that's just one organ that's the brain right i mean it happens everywhere uh in every organ and in different ways um but those are key processes that are in fact involved in the progression of uh of neurodegenerative disease but i i think the importance and relevance of what you just said is how important exercise activity nutrient intake and timing and sleep are to maintaining a very, very healthy lifestyle. And you just, you just heard me, um, we just got off with a patient and you heard me say something that I thought I, I wanted to make sure was real relevant. And it's, ama it's, it's amazing how even when people feel they're doing things correctly in mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. they're they're not really, they're, they're kind of off. They're not there. They may think they're eating healthy, but they may, you know, their biggest meal is dinner. Yeah. And their dinner is later at night, like eight at night or nine or, you know, which is the absolute worst thing you can do Yeah. from, from the feeding feedback of the circadian clock. Right. Cause we've, what we've always said and what we what we emphasize is make your biggest meal your earliest meal and your smallest meal is always your evening meal. And it should be before six or seven, if, if possible, you got to do it. You just got to do it to get the, it's getting that clock function back. So I will say for, for, we, we kind of talked about it in two episodes ago when we were talking about summer bods, um, getting ready for summer bod, lower belly fat. You had me do another challenge, Doc. And we talked to a, a, few, a few of your patients. Um, uh, and you you give them you give them the same challenge. And I have to say, within four days, I saw a difference. Four days. 
And it wasn't just in the difference in the weight that that happened, but it was the difference in the lower belly fat. That is very stubborn. We're, we're, we're told is the toughest thing to get rid of. But with those very simple changes where you said, eat your biggest meal early and finish, finish eating dinner by six. That's a small, smallest meal. And then the exercise right after. Yeah. I just did those things. And, and we've just given, I mean, those cues are so valuable for people that just, if you want to grab onto a start, start there and that'll make, that'll make a tremendous difference if you do get out and move your butt after the meal, yeah. because it's all about controlling insulin. That's what it all comes down to, insulin and glucose. And in fact, you know, we all, we've talked about this on other episodes. You add that little extra layer of what are you going to do in your meal? No matter what you're eating, if we're not talking about diets per se, what are you going to eat first, Karen? Protein. What do you eat second? Veggie. What do you eat last? Carbs. Eat the there bread last. There you go. If you can regiment your meal like that, uh, you, you, I mean, you get the pleasure of seeing all the people at a, that we help and, yes. and, and, you know, it, it's, it takes you a little while, but when you start hearing and what's happening to people, then you're like, okay, I better listen to Dr. Seeds a little bit. <laughs> he and, knows his, he kind of knows some things. And, that, and I'm testing this one out because you know what, I'm going to go for it now. Yeah. Oh, it, it works. And it worked. I was, I was floored at how fast it works. And now doc, I don't even, I would be constantly low carb, low carb to zero carb, like eat no breads, which sucks because bread is amazing. Right. And now I just have bread as in the right order, but at lunch, that's my first meal of the day. And I Perfect. don't eat any breads at night. Right. It's, I still stick to low carb, but I feel much better about life because I get to eat something, you know, carby and delicious. <laughs> sure. And that's where that's where people I think make you know that's all or nothing stuff just doesn't work and it's not a way to, to sustain your life and um there's good and bads there's good things to it starting maybe or getting you in a in a regimented state but but yeah you got to do something that's sustainable and lifelong and you want to be happy doing it. I would imagine doc and and get, getting back on my my track of questions here that. Um, folks have, uh, especially as we pass our like mid thirties, we start to really uh, hone in on, okay, my hormones might be out of whack. I would imagine that because you said that the circadian rhythms is reg is a regulator of cellular functions. That's a huge line, by the way, no wonder you're a big fan of circadian rhythms and always talking about it at every event. Um, I would imagine that this is also going to help with hormone deficiencies and balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's why it's why before you jump into a lot of treatment plans, you just start working on the basics of okay. that's that's why that that's why there are so many powerful influencers out there, your trainers, your dietitians, your your um, wellness coaches. I mean, they know what they're doing with these things of trying to get people in a in, in their the right wellness habits, because then they make our job so much easier. It's a team effort, right? It's getting all these things that work. And, and there are a lot of brilliant people out there doing some amazing things because they're just sticking to the basics, right? The basics of making what they may not be aware of, or they may be, it's making the circadian clock function and synchronized. And mm -hmm. And there's so much to that. Um, it's it's interesting, you know. It's if if your circadian clock turns off in the brain, um, your there's there's some specific uh, there's some specific uh, channels that turn off, and uh, in particular, if there's some disruption, your your uh, glymphatic um, flow out of the brain is inhibited. And that's absolutely affected by this, by circadian rhythms. Um, what does that do? The glymphatic flow. So glymphatic, glymphatics are like lymphatics in the body, but they're glymphatics in the brain. And it's the drainage of the brain, basically of the, of 
you know, what's happening with autophagy and things, how the brain cleans itself. It's just a, it's that lymph, uh, you know, the, the debris of tissue and so forth that has to be drained. And that can be very, that, that significantly influences the neurodegenerative disease because it, it's influenced on these pores opening up and draining. And um, makes sense. It has a direct effect on it. Oh, geez. So bad circadian clock health means possibly a higher risk for neurodegenerative diseases. Right. Well, what it, what it really comes down to is that it's a, it's a series of things that happen, but mm -hmm. what happens is the, these glial cells in the brain, the microglial cells and the astrocytes start producing these inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and proteases. And those, those have, they downregulate these, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, aquaporin, uh, four channels, and those are the channels that actually uh, release uh, uh, release glimp. I'm, I'm pretty sure from the brain, yeah. And and that that's all secondary to these problems of what what we talked about that happens in this series of of uh, of um, problems. Um, if we want to relate to uh, circadian disruption of you know inflammation, blood flow decreased, uh, what do we say, melatonin, all of those things, you know. That is, that, that's, that's truly fascinating. And these are, the, these don't require a single prescription. No, and, and it's- None of this. No, it, you know how people like use, here's, a, here's another, so people try to correct their own circadian problems by like taking melatonin at nighttime, mm. right? Because, because what happens is in our lifestyles, uh, if light at nighttime it, it, as circadian clocks, as we work with the earth, right? When light, when the natural sunlight goes away, that induces our brain to start making melatonin, which is something that helps with regulating, has many ways of working that people aren't really aware of, of what it does, has many significant aspects in metabolism. In working on insulin sensitivity, in working, uh, in, it, it works in in helping with sleep stages, but real important is it's an antioxidant. It's a scavenger that's actually so. So the circadian here's something interesting actually that should the circadian clock actually make certain antioxidants for the daytime and then for the nighttime. It's like the most active antioxidants at night are melatonin and ascorbic acid and some plasma thiols are, are very active at night. And then in the morning, like glutathione peroxidase, uh, uh, superoxide desmentase, um, peroxy, uh, um, rheodoxins, um, uh, catalase, those are all for the daytime, which, mm. which, which the body is preparing you know, to get the highest amount of antioxidants ready as we start the day. And that makes sense. And then at night where they're utilized in a different way, different antioxidants. So, so they're very important in maintaining the circadian rhythms, but the circadian rhythms are very important in maintaining those antioxidant ratios that control basically the inflammatory status of the body. So it's all fascinating when you think about it and how much of it really comes together. Once you understand these molecular pathways, you just sit back and go, wow, this is starting to make sense. This, okay, I get it. I get it. That's can... cool, Doc. Yeah. I have a, I have a um, personal question for you. You, I follow you on, on social and one of your posts was about resetting your clock because um, you, you were flying to Beverly Hills and then you wanted to reset your clock, I guess. And then you're working out in the morning. Like what is, what is actually happening into the reset of the clock by doing it in the morning versus at other times of the day? Just exercise just induces, uh, it induces, if you can do it early, it just helps kind of set that rhythm, this, the, the feedback and starting that, uh, the, the big pathway of, 
this this uh, NAD um, salvage pathway, basically of turning on the nicotinamide phospho uh, ribosyl transferase that is all about that's the rate limiting enzyme that sets up the what you need to turn on these transcription factors uh, like the clock gene and the BLMA uh, genes and the you know the things that you uh, uh, that you need to turn transcription on to activate the circadian mechanisms early on. So it's just a feedback mechanism that that I utilize to kind of do its best to keep me, you know, you're not going to change it 100%, but it sure helps um, mm. in, in regulating time zones. And I'm I'm very sensitive to the time zone stuff because of the amount of travel I do like that and, right. and around and around the world, you know, you have to be, you got to use these mechanisms because I need my brain working and I need it sharp and I need, <laughs> and I don't need health problems. So, so I utilize those understanding of those mechanisms and how I eat and, um, and do the best I can to control it. We don't let you get sick. We, that, that, you, that can't happen. Um, I have another personal question. Have, have you ever seen me sick? No, I've not been sick in a really long time either. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's very cool. Um, the you do you have a tougher time going from east to west coast or west to east coast? West to east coast. West to east because you're losing the hours. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah. Um. This this past weekend, my Mike, uh, my my business partner, who we we also work very closely with Doctor Seeds, we took uh, a bunch of kids to Legoland and. Um, a few of them were coughing in our faces just all day. Um, <laughs> I kind of got a little scratchy throat, but Mike is done today. He is done and he's a smoker. So I blame it on that. I told him that's why you're, you got sick and I didn't. Well, I just have a scratchy throat. <laughs> well, you got Mike's, Mike's working on things. He's, he's trying, yeah. he's, come a, he's come a long way, Such but but this, these will just open more doors for him to just kind of realize <laughs> that, wow, I can do more. Yes. You know, I can do more to control this. And he's cut back significantly because of the constant nagging um, from, from my end, really. You, I don't think you nag him at all. But <laughs> I, I let people make their own decisions. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a little more forceful. Uh, but yes, this is fascinating. Okay, so one last question uh, before we wrap it up. I want to get back to what you were talking about for Alzheimer's um, and how it's, it's, it's fascinating that at a certain time of the day, I'm, I'm guessing later in the day, they get a little more, there's symptoms and, and feelings of, of the Alzheimer's stuff gets a little more um, pronounced as you go later in the day. Um, what, and, and then you start talking about the types of studies around, around um, uh, circadian clock, like that chronobiology thing. Uh, does that have anything to do? And this is a crazy like preview question of what we're going to discuss later this weekend on the 12th. But does that have anything to do with the new FDA treatment that came out for Alzheimer's? Like uh, the first approved thing in 18 years, Doc? No, well, that's just some pressure for them to get to get moving and, and where we have some therapies. That's more that's more antibody um, directed therapies to these amyloid beta um, accumulations to try because it's 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 amyloid beta that maybe you know amyloid buildup is protein buildup basically that's just gone wrong and it's amyloid that leads to tau which is another protein pathology that seems to be more of the implicative problem in 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 increasing inflammation than oxidative stress and then immune dysregulation and insulin system dysregulation and then neuronal death that kind of stuff but but it's the the this type of there are a couple of them out there actually this is the one that's approved but there's some there there are some um there are some that uh some molecules actually smaller molecules that inhibit that will directly work on inhibiting the um amyloid beta production oh wow accumulation yeah, that are very similar. And, and then there's the antibodies that go after these accumulations that are 
insoluble type of problems. But the problem is much deeper. And, and I, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful that we got some FDA, that, that's, a, that's the beginning because that gives people a lot of hope. But there's so much more out there. And, and we're focused on working on those areas and before those areas. And because this is it's a much bigger problem than, than just accumulation of proteins. Um, it means something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong to cause that accumulation of proteins. So, so yeah, you can, we can, we can use that in conjunction with other therapies. I think it's a, it's going to be a wonderful thing to add in to potential ways of going at, you know, working with this disease process. And I think we're going to give a really nice, uh, an amazing, amazing summary of ways that we look at neurodegeneration and, and common and some sp- potential solutions at, at slowing down the process or possibly even preventing the process and, um, uh, and, and some amazing research uh, that has been brought to, you know, that's brought to the forefront of, of neuro growth and uh, regeneration that we're going to be presenting here um, that I'm sure no one's heard of and, and testing methods that I'm sure no one's heard of. So we're going to, this is going to be an incredible information download for people to bring because what everybody needs is hope. And, and we're going to give a lot of hope to a lot of people, I believe, and, and open this wide open, I, I think in, in where, where we're headed in, in working in this field. And why can we say this? Because we're already treating patients like this and we're already helping these people. And, and, you know, it's, it's, um, we're not people just talking about something and, and promoting theories. We're actually out there taking care of people that have these problems. And that says a lot. And it means a, a lot more because it's boots on the ground type of research and not just theory. I, I think that's, that's very, very strong. Um, folks, please go see our lineup for this Saturday, June 12th. We start at 9 a.m. Central Time. That's bright and early on Pacific Time, if you're like me, at 7 a.m. We're going to do it for you on a Saturday. It's going to be from 9 a.m. Central to about 3 p.m. Central. And it, you can go check it out at ssrpinstitute.org slash ALZ. Go check it out. It's free to join. You pop in your email, you're going to get an email uh, right after that with our Zoom webinar link that you can join directly. Uh, We're also going to forward you on to the AFA, a wonderful foundation for Alzheimer's. Not only do they help and fund research that helps to get more FDA approvals out in the future, but also they help in providing programs to patients and families dealing with Alzheimer's, of course, with financial assistance for uh, for those families who need it just all around a stand-up organization. They're super transparent with where your donation is going and 100% of your donation, whatever the amount is going to the AFA. We have some amazing prizes that we're giving away too, by the way, throughout the day. And so we're going to have lots of fun while that's going on. Dr. Seeds will be hosting that that uh, with the, a lot of his fellows at the SSRP, his faculty at the SSRP, in addition to some very special guests who will be really describing some cutting edge research and practical things for Alzheimer's. So it's going to be such a great day. Um, we I had no idea how prevalent the disease was until we started doing this research. And it's it's gonna it's it's gonna hopefully just like Dr. C said, provide some hope where we need it most. I love it. Can't wait. So uh, for those of you listening, um, I just I like to do these recaps when we go super deep into Dr. C's science. Circadian rhythm super important. Uh, it's how we exist. It's the regulator of cellular functions, the mechanisms of cellular functions. That line needs to be repeated over and over again, because if you've been following Dr. Seeds, he talks about cellular functions and pathways all the time and, and, and redox. And if this is regulating those things, 
it's got to be freaking important. And guess what? It doesn't require a single prescription. It is about nutrition, uh, nutrition timing, uh, exercise, and good sleep. Yep. And if and if it gets more detailed, we got <laughs> lots of ways to work into those those rhythms. I mean, that's that's the beauty of this of how it all comes together and makes sense for people. So, awesome. thank you, Karen. Lovely. Well, folks, I hope to see you on Saturday and Dr. Seeds. I will see you again so soon. I'm excited. I can't wait. I'm, I don't think, um, I think my circadian clocks will be <laughs> upset for the next week because I won't be able to sleep until we do it. <laughs> well, that, that is a big regulator. So <laughs> we got to We got to get that going, doc. You got it. All right. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye, Karen. Thank you, everyone.